Hello friends, here is one more edition of our Bible discussion and today the topic is um, an everlasting covenant and we are going to talk about Abraham or Abraham as you know more. Let's have a word of prayer to start. Heavenly Father, thank you for your blessings, thank you for being with us. Forgive our sins and be with us during this discussion that we can learn more about you and learn more about the covenants that you did with human beings and especially the covenant that you want to do with us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. <coughs> the memory verse for this um, week of study is found in Genesis 17:7. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. And this was given to Abraham. And I will ask the first question here, the same I ask about Noah. Did God show Abraham out of all humans, especially, or, or Abraham shows God first? What comes first? Um, the, still the idea that we have is the fact that God shows special people, special and give special vocations to someone. But um, the point that I want to make is that God chooses everyone. And then there are the ones that respond and there are the ones that didn't, that do not respond. And then Abraham was the one that responded. And then Abraham developed this connection with the Lord. Um, and then God gave more and more and more. To, to Abraham. So it's not that um, he shows a specific this guy from the beginning and and, um, and then um, he was a blessed one. Um, he could not, he could have refused that and that's the point. He shows some of us for special purposes but we have the freedom of choice. And remember, I mentioned about um, uh, Solomon that was uh, that was chosen, but um, he commit mistakes. He shows uh, Saul, King Saul, also was chosen, but he didn't follow um, God as much. And then the the, the history goes on and on, like um, Judas, um, like uh, Ananias, um, like Samson. Uh, those are those were chosen ones, but didn't establish this covenant, and that's and that's the point here. God wants to do a covenant with me. Uh, I would not say and, and with you, and I'm not saying about the church and about the Christian church and the Adventist church. I'm talking about individual covenant, and that's the point here. God needed an ambassador on earth to proclaim his message to humans. And, he, and God always needs that. He needs, to have, he needs to have people here to represent God to other people, to preach the truth to other people, to tell the other people what's going to happen, to explain to other people why we are in this situation in this world, what happened in the past. What is the meaning of life today and what is going to happen in the future? So that's why God needs someone on, in on that. And on that time, he looked at Abraham because he said, well, this one, I, I'll, maybe this is a good one because he is walking with me. He, he is um, open to receive my Holy Spirit. He is open to receive my message of salvation and truth and spread this to, to his family and to other people around. 
So in the beginning of the lesson, we have um, the identification of the Lord, Yahweh. We, we call Yahweh, but um, it looks like this pronunciation, is, nobody knows very well what is that. Um, if we try to put this in English, it would be Yuf, Yuf, or something like that. And God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, Thus you shall say to the children of Israel, I am has sent me to you. And that's the meaning of Yahweh. Um, I am is the name of God, uh, four, letters, four letters in Hebrew, um, Yahweh or Jehovah. Um, it, it was interesting, you read in the lesson that is uh, mentioned 6,828 times in the Old Testament just to show the importance of that word or the importance of, uh, of the Bible as um, a written word of the Lord. The Apostle John translated it as who is and who was and who is to come. Exactly what I mentioned in the last slide. Once you are an ambassador of, uh, of God, of Jesus Christ, you can Tell people about the past, because Jesus was in the past. You can, um, you can we can talk about the uh, present world, who is, and because Jesus is uh, involved in our affairs today. And then we can talk about the future, and then who is to come. And the future, whatever happens in this world in the future, we know that we have a hope of the second coming and a hope of a new earth and a new heavens prepared for those that accept this message from God. Moses used this name when telling the first conversation between God and Abraham. Um, it looks like the Yahweh or whatever we um, we spell that <clears throat> or pronunciate that, it, it, it comes from a verb in um, in the Hebrew that um, uh, is is I am. I mean, is the the verb to be uh, that we know in our English. That's why we translate to I am. I am means an eternal presence. The past, present, and future are alike with God. He sees the most remote events of past history and the far distant future with as clear a vision as we do those things which are transpiring daily. We know not what is before us, and if we did, it would not contribute to our eternal welfare. God gives us an opportunity to exercise faith and trust in the great I am. So we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. And um, so many psychics um, are there. To today is a modern things, and 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 then people are kind of um, going forward to those psychics. But psychics cannot know anything. Sometimes they can predict something based on our own life. And I, I'll tell you, I used to have a patient um, who um, one time he told me, he was an old man, he told me that um, uh, he encountered one time a gypsy. Uh, in Brazil, the gypsy used to read the, the, the palms of the hands and give you the perspective of, of your future. And when this gypsy approached him, he told her, Hey, I can read your hands. And then she was saying, What you are talking about? I am the expert. He said, But I have enough um, inspiration to do so. And then he got her hand, and then he said, You know what I see here? I see a woman that has uh, many. These lines mean many kids, and this main line here means that uh, you have a husband, but the husband does not treat you well, and then you have to go to the streets and you have to provide for your family. So 
your situation at home is not the best one. And then she opened her eyes, how do you know that? And then uh, they talk a little more and, th and that was the end of this. And then he said, you know, I could read your, your hands. And then later on he told me that um, he didn't read anything. He was just estimating based on, on what he saw. A lady with a bunch of kids running in the street selling uh, pots and reading hands. She must have a hard time at home. And then she, uh, he read her hands and, 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 and portraying that he was doing so. But uh, the only one that can read, read your hands and can read your mind and can you read your heart is Jesus Christ, is God. He knows what is in your life. He knows what is in the future in your life. He knows what happened in the past. And he is willing to work with you. What you need to do is simple. It's just give your heart to him. Put in his hands. And he will do whatever it is better. Which is best for you. And then we have another name. El Shaddai. El Shaddai is the God Almighty. So not only God is the great I Am. Uh, omniscient Lord, the ones that know everything, past, present and future, but he is powerful. And um, people are, are sometimes say, well, uh, if God is powerful, why, why, why does not he do, do that, or that or or this one? It looks like sometimes we are like the people that were um, with Jesus when he was crucified. And, and, and then people look at, the, at this body of, uh, of a human being uh, nailed to a cross and, and then they said, if you are the son of man, if you are a son of God, if you are a God, why don't you call the angels to deliver you? And why, why are you dying here? Well, they didn't have an, an idea about that. And same thing to us. Sometimes they say, well, you are a Christian. Why is this thing happening to you? Why are you suffering? Why you have this? Why you have that? And, uh, and then we need to be ready to, to do that. We have, we have a God Almighty. We have an El Shaddai. But uh, we live in a world that is full of sin. We live in a world that um, is not our world. And our response could be very clear. Well, I don't know why I'm having that. I don't know why this happened to me. But I know one thing. God is preparing something bigger for me. God is preparing something bigger for you. God is preparing something bigger for humanity. When, uh, when He finished all of this business in this world, we will go to a different level of life. And that's enough for us to know uh, that El Shaddai is, is powerful. Um, I just wrote, finished wrote, writing a book that is called God is Still Powerful. And I collected a few signature, um, a few stories that uh, I heard or stories that happened to my life and um, that show that God still has, I mean, in the present time, God still show power, the same power that he showed during, um, during the times of the Old Testament in the Bible. We sometimes don't see it. Maybe we don't see it that frequently, but um, we, we can, if we open your eyes to see we will see that the hand of God is in human affairs today. I just want to share one story that I wrote in my book. My book is, um, I submit to the publisher, maybe a few months, um, or I will put in, the, in, in Kindle. Um, as you know, I already published one about humor. Now I'm getting a little serious and talking about a little bit about God. And then, um, but uh, this story that I'm going to uh, share with you 
is a kind of a tradition story for Christians in the United States. We don't know very well the origins uh, of this, uh, specifically where the church is located, but, um, but it's a very interesting story that um, shows that God can be powerful today uh, as uh, much as he was in the past. There was a small congregation in, uh, looks like this was in the southeast uh, part of the United States, uh, around uh, Tennessee, Georgia, um, Alabama states. And then um, this uh, small congregation grew up and they need to build up a new church. So they um, talked to the church members and one member gave um, a land to build up the church. And the church members got together and started building. I mean, old times when they built the church by themselves on weekends. So they built up that church. And when they were ready to inaugurate the church, the local city um, uh, uh, building um, uh, reviewer came to check the property. And then they said, hey, you guys cannot cannot continue with this building. And then, then they said, well, how can you do that? We already finished the building. We just need to do the, the, the internal part and we are going to be ready to, to move in. They said, no, you cannot because you don't have a parking lot. And there is a strict rules that a church has to have enough space to park the cars of its members. And then they got in trouble. They didn't realize about that. The only solution that they would have is in the back of the church, there was a small hill, not enough to park the cars, but um, because it was a hill. But if, uh, if they flattened that, that would be enough to, to to, to park the car, but there was no time, and if they will, they didn't have a budget for that, and there was no time, there was no money, there was no possibility. Then what the church decided to do? Yes, they start to do weekly prayers for moving mountains. Remember the, the time of Jesus Christ that he said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you could move mountains. You could pray to the Lord and the Lord would move mountains. Mountains, And this is interesting because when they pray, uh, the church has about 300 members. And then in the prayer meetings, only 25 or so came, um, about 10%, I mean, 25 to 30 members. And then uh, it looks like the other 90, the other, um, 90% uh, of members did not get into the moving mountain movements. I mean, say, okay, I mean, you have faith, or we better think about something else, and we better, um, I guess they already closed the other church, uh, and then now uh, to, to, to provide money to build up this one, and now they could not go on the church, so they kind of didn't know what to do. But the moving, the moving mountain prayer meetings continue. And, um, and then they were praying that God opened the way for them. And one day, uh, it was a Sunday morning, someone knocked at the door of the pastor's house. And then uh, the pastors attended the door and said, okay, um, who, who are you? And then he said, um, um, are you the pastor that uh, from that church in the corner there? And then say yes, and said yes, but who are you? Well, I am an engineer here in, in the town, in town, and I am building up a shopping mall um, a little bit of, in the um, outskirts of the city. And, um, and then I came with a problem there. There is a big gap in the middle of the land that I need to fill out. I thought I could get over that with a building, but um, I really need to have dirt there. So I passed in front of your church several times 
and I saw that you have a hill you know, on the back. I could flatten that hill for you, pay for that dirt, and that will solve my problem. And uh, if you agree, I don't know if, if it's good for you, but um, I can do that for free. And in, in fact, I can pay for you to do that. And the pastor got the members together and of course they accepted that offer. And then the, this um, was a, a, a problem solving for them. The land was flattened. They put the parking lot there and, and then they were able to start their church. So this is something very exciting that showed that God today can move, still can be powerful. El Shaddai is today. I appear, uh, so let's go back to our lesson. I appeared to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob as God Almighty. So we, uh, we know that he did a lot of powerful things and then we know that he was with Moses doing marvelous things in Egypt, crossing the Red Sea, things that uh, we could not imagine could happen. And if we have faith as a mustard seed, he can do those things today. With Abraham, God Almighty, uh, Abraham could not have a child because of weakness and fragility of the fallen human nature. Nevertheless, the Almighty One had enough power to make it possible. We are going to come back to this, to this situation here. Isaac blessed Jacob in the name of El Shaddai, and God appeared before Jacob using this name, El Shaddai. Jack, Jacob also used the same name to bless others. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This is in the New Testament. This is Philippians 4.19, written by Paul. God will meet all your needs. So God might not give you all the riches that you have in this world. But he is powerful enough to give you shelter, to give you clothes, to give you food. If you have shelter, clothes and food, what else you need? These are the basic needs. So if you go by Maslow theory of, uh, of needs, well, he put a little more. He put socialization, he put um, um, belonging to something, he put uh, um, uh, some other um, needs that we have, but um, uh, the basic three are still there: food, shelter, and clothes. If and and then um, we can be sure that uh, even though we have troubles in life, these three are guaranteed by by the Lord. So now let's talk about names. No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name shall be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. So we will talk about um, names here. Um, the names of people in the old Eastern world represent their character. When something significant happened, they could change their names. And that's what happened too. Um, Abraham, that uh, used to be called um, Abram, um, the father, um, well, I, I have the name here in a, in a few minutes. Um, God changed the name of Abram, father is exalted, so that's the name of, uh, of Abram, and then to a father of a multitude. That's a new name for Abraham. Um, from that moment, he would be known as the father of a multitude. And this strengthened their, his faith. And I put a, a little bit of other names here. Uh, Daniel, and God is my judge. Uh, Joel, Yahweh is God. Nathan, 
the gift of God. And I was looking at my name um, to see what happens, uh, uh, what meaning my name has. And so my first name is Hildemar. And Hildemar was a name that was coming from German. Um, I, I was born in south of Brazil, not German descendant, but uh, the influence there is much bigger than my mother. Put me a name, uh, uh, the first name as a German name, meaning that uh, I went there was a, a brave warrior. That, that was the first one. But then later on, uh, there was uh, other variations and other explanations, a brave person and things like that. And even we got to a point that Ildemar could be a girl's name. And that was very depressive. And uh, for a while I was thinking to change or use my, use my second name. I am Hildemar Feliciano or Feliciano. And Feliciano is more uh, related to happiness, nothing to do with a warrior. And by the way, I am not a warrior at all. And then, uh, but uh, Feliciano would be uh, better. And uh, one time I opened a Facebook and I put Hildemar Feliciano there. And then a friend of mine said, hey, I know Hildemar, but why is that Feliciano in your Facebook page? <laughs> well, I was trying to get a little more on the uh, happiness thing. I mean, Felice or Feliz uh, means uh, to be happy in Portuguese and Felice maybe in Italian or, or in, uh, in Latin. Um, and Felicidad um, uh, or Felicitations or something. We have some of those words in in, in, in English also, but uh, not Feliz, uh, Feliz, uh, Feliz Navidad should be um, Merry Christmas, but uh, Feliz will be Merry, uh, Happy, uh, Prosper or something, uh, uh, content. And that's what I was thinking to change my name, but well, not change, use my other name. But in any case, uh, uh, I have, uh, my name is Hildemar Feliciano dos Santos. Uh, in Brazil, they call me Hildemar. In, um, in, in, in America, they call me Dos Santos. Um, I have no idea why they put Dos Santos in my family, uh, because we are not saints at all. Santos means saints. Well, then we go to uh, the covenant stages. Um, now the Lord had said to Abram, get out of your country from your family and from your father's house to a land that I will show you. Well, that's, uh, that's something uh, not, that's a challenge for some people. Um, I have this challenge um, for three times in my life. First, I was born in south of Brazil, and then somehow God called me to move from my family with my wife. Um, on that time, it's just me and my wife, and moved to Sao Paulo that was um, about 600 miles away. No, not, not very uh, far, but, um, but was a completely different uh, place. I was born in a smaller city, and then I moved to Sao Paulo, the biggest city in South America. And, this, um, and then I was just me and my wife. Uh, we left everyone behind, my mother, my father, my brother, my friends, my relatives. All stay in the south, the south of Brazil, close to Argentina and Uruguay, where I was born. Now I am moving to the center of Brazil, Sao Paulo. And then after... A, 14 years living in Sao Paulo, I moved to America. That was a big move. And then I moved to Loma Linda, where I stay, um, where I start studying uh, the Master in Public Health, the DRPH in Preventive Care. And then I finished that um, uh, in the year 2000. And then I have another move in the year 2000. Um, I was uh, somehow called to go to Hong Kong I have a call to go there, uh, an opportunity to work there. So I moved there and I stay, I stay there for six years working in the Hong Kong Adventist Hospital as the director of the um, uh, lifestyle management department there. And then 
after the six years, we will have a fourth move. Uh, I don't consider a fourth because it's a part of the third, me, uh, of the second, meaning that I was called again to come back to the United States where I was um, uh, called to be the professor of this uh, of Loma Linda, the position that I am uh, uh, now working for the health, um, um, public health, uh, the School of Public Health, and uh, in the preventive care program. At first, I was a professor in the preventive care. Now I am the director of the program. But um, all of those calls were not uh, were not easy to to. To change, I mean, to 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 make a move. Uh, we we have children, we have a wife, and we have a family, and uh, sometimes we have to bring the children together. That's what I did when I moved to the United States. When I moved from the south to São Paulo, I brought my wife, and she was pregnant already, so no much uh, uh, struggle on that. But then when I moved to the States, I brought my three children that were born in, the, in São Paulo. And then when I moved to Hong Kong, I had to leave, to leave my children behind. They were in a boarding school already, in college, but then we stay kind of uh, more than uh, uh, 8,000 or 7,000 miles away. Now that was a very big distance. And then we, um, we stayed there for six years. And fortunately after that, we rejoined and uh, somehow, well, the family was now a, a little um, dispersed. I mean, the kids were in different places, but uh, we still um, we still have um, we still live close to them. In, in any case, uh, it was not easy to to do those moves, and that's what uh, Abraham or Abraham was called by God to do. God sealed his covenant with Abraham, with Abraham in three stages, or in three parts. The first one was the, the approach. God said to Abraham, go out of your country. And uh, Abraham, Abraham was, might my, my have said, well, my Lord, I can, can, can I work here? Um, so that's uh, the temptation that we have. Sometimes when we have a call to go outside of our bo uh, box, <laughs> or outside of our comfort zone, um, we say, Lord, can I stay here, please? I like here. But the Lord said to Abraham, hey, you go, I will be with you, don't worry. But I don't know anybody there. Go there, no, no concerns. And then Abraham asked a question. Um, How can I know that you are going to be with me? And then um, there was this ceremonial that I put some pieces of uh, dead uh, animals there. And then there was this power of, uh, of God with fire that God responded. And then God said, you will be with me and I will make you uh, and your descendants to own this land and to be a blessed um, uh, by me, so just just go with me, and you are gonna be okay. And that's a character that Abraham developed. He submitted himself to the Lord, and he submitted. And he, this submission was the secret of his relationship with the Lord. And that's the same thing for us. If we are close to the Lord, and the Lord show us, open the doors for us, we might need to go in that direction without any fear. People say, well, you are going to do things that are weird. Well, I did. I mean, most of my friends stay in the city that I was and they are still there. I visit them after 40 years. They are still doing the same thing. And, and I am far away. I am thousands of miles away. But uh, I believe I am doing one thing that I would never be done if I if I stay there. I'll tell you, I I learned my I barely knew how to speak Portuguese. Okay, my Portuguese was kind of poor. I studied the grammar. That's the language that I studied the grammar the most. But I never had the intention to learn another language. When I was in school, I learned. 
English to pass the exams because we need English to pass the exams. But I never dreamed that I will one day be speaking like I'm doing that with you now. I remember several times when I was working in a hostel, there was some um, um, doctors that came from America that they need a translator and they uh, spoke to us. By the way, one of them was Dr. Mervyn Harding. Dr. Mervyn Harding was the director um, or the founder of the School of Public Health in Loma Linda and also was the founder of the Preventive Care Program. And I met Dr. Harding in Brazil when I was a physician. He was on that time working for the general um, conference of the Seventh-day Adventists and I could not speak the language. I had to talk to him through a translator. And, uh, and then I talked to Dr. John Scharfenberg also. He was working for uh, the Seventh-day Adventist Con uh, General Conference. He visited Brazil. I talked to him in, in, um, with a translator uh, speaking Portuguese. So I didn't have a dream to talk, to, to, to go to another place, to go to another country, to speak another la language. It was not in my, in my plans for life. But here I am, and I was able to speak to um, Dr. Mervyn Harding in English one time when I came here, and I was able to speak to my friend Dr. John Scheifenberg, that is 97 years old now, but uh, we were able to speak in English uh, finally after I had to uh, learn English in order to come here and to be a professor in the school. Okay, I still have this strong accent. I recognize that. But, um, but uh, what I'm saying is that um, God will guide you. Even though you don't think that you have the abilities, and that's what the, the struggle for Abraham. Uh, I don't have... Um, there is another challenge for Abraham. He even didn't have a child. How can I be, how can I have descendants of my own blood if I don't have a child? And I, I still have to talk about that. But uh, the point here is for us. If God chooses us to do something, if you open your heart to the Lord, He will guide you. He will open the doors and, and then He will say, um, John, Mary, um, Michelle, um, Suzanne, whoever you are, um, this is the plan that I have for you. Go for it and I will be with you. I will guide you and I will open the doors that I need for you. So that's, that's what happened to Abraham. And then Abraham uh, requests something from, uh, from uh, God requests something for Abraham. I am the Alm Almighty God uh, and then in order for you to go and to separate uh, yourself for me, I need you to do this with your uh, children. Uh, and then they, they um, install the um, right of circumcision. Um, and then the, the other verse that, um, that um, uh, we have here, is behind my screen. He said, I will give you to your descendants the land that you are in now. And Abraham was thinking, how can you give that to my descendants? I don't have a son and I don't have a land here. And most of the people that live around me that own this land are the Canaanites. And then they are not following you very well. They are not friends of you, so I cannot even socialize with these guys because they, they adore other gods. They kill their kids to, to make sacrifice to their gods. So I, can, I cannot do that. I cannot be friend of people like that. So um, what are you saying that you are going to give this land to me? I don't understand that. But um, when you have these doubts in your life, you just put in God's hands. And that's what Abram, Abram did. And God requests, hey, the only thing that I request for you is obey me and do this circumcision that uh, means that you are going to be separate from uh, all of these people and your, 
you are have a sign of a connection every time your children will be circumcised it means that they are going to be dedicated to the Lord and they will remember that forever God established this covenant with Abraham and his descendants directly but it also covers all human beings we will talk about that in the next slides So let's take a look on the Abram's problem now. He was 99 years old and his wife Sarah was 90 years old. Well, on that time, I mean, the, after um, the flood, the average human being on that time, I mean, the longevity was already 120 years old. So it looks like Abram has only 20 more years. But with 99 years old, I'm not sure if he was able to procreate. And for sure, uh, Sarah, with 90, 90 years old, she was uh, uh, away after menopause. And then that's why they left when God said like, uh, like that. When God told Abraham, hey, you're going to have a son. And, uh, and so... Um, Abram said, well, I mean, can, can my servant Eliezer the, from, from Damascus be the one? And then God said, no, you are going to have a, your blood, son. Okay, so he, um, he uh, or Sarah, arranged with um, um, her servant, Sarah's servant, and then we have Ismael. Uh, and then Ismael, Ishmael was was born, and then uh, Abraham said, "Okay, now I have a son." And then God said, "No, this is not your descendant. They will be a big nation too, but uh, you will have a son of yourself." And then uh, with Sarah, and then Abraham laughed again and said, "Well, Sarah cannot do it. I even cannot do it anymore." And they left. So when they um, Sarah was pregnant and, and then she got the baby Isaac um, they put the name uh, Isaac I believe God wants them to put the name because the name Isaac means he laughs or he will laugh um, saying that now is the time well don't we have this proverb and we have this proverb in Portuguese that uh, the last person to laugh uh, will laugh more um, or we will laugh better. So meaning that don't laugh at the beginning of things because the guys uh, later on are the ones that really will laugh. Uh, we might have something in English similar. But uh, that's what God was saying. Hey, put the name of this guy. He laughs because you will remember forever to trust me. I told you that you are going to have a son with Sarah, both of you, and this son will be the beginning of your descendants. Not Ishmael, not Eliezer, but Isaac. And the, and the name of this boy is going to be, he left. Because you laugh at me, now I'm going to laugh lately, lately. And then we talk about... Um, what the meaning of the descendants uh, or what they call offsprings. In Genesis 15, 5, he took him outside and said, look up at the sky and count the stars. So Abraham went outside and uh, looked at the, uh, the sky and he could not count the, the stars. And the stars is, 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 is kind of uh, almost impossible. Um, then he said to him, so shall your offsprings be. So you are not going to be able to count the offsprings. So the theologians discuss what is the offspring here. And then um, the offspring can be literally the descendants of Abraham or the Jewish nation. That uh, after years and years we cannot even know how many um, uh, Jewish we have in the world uh, all of these years. So is uncountable if we have this word in English. 
and then, but the offspring could also be um, prophetically the Messiah, and the offspring could be could be us, that all people in the earth will be um, will be the offspring of Jesus. So prophetically, the Messiah would come, and from the Messiah, they will spread. Uh, the uh, the message of Jesus, the message of God to all nations, and then the offspring of Abraham will be for all um, all peoples. So the way that all peoples on earth will be blessed could be to two different applications. One was the one that we studied a few lessons before, that Israel could be the country that accepted Jesus Christ and that preached the gospel of Jesus Christ to all the world. And this will be um, the blessings for, for the world. And the, as they didn't um, accomplish that, I mean, they rejected, they even killed Jesus Christ. Well, the Romans killed, but they condemned Jesus Christ. They kind of reject that part and then God has to reject them as nations. Does not mean that um, Jewish are not good. Um, God accept any Jewish um, who wants to accept um, him uh, as as their Messiah again. No problem about that. But um, but then the the second option that God used now was the church, the Christian church, that through the acceptance of the Messiah Jesus Christ. They are now the all peoples on earth that will bless it through Abraham. Abraham um, and in, on its descendants uh, end up with Jesus Christ. And through Jesus Christ, the Messiah, all people are blessed to be with God, to have salvation in the Lord. And that's uh, the big message that uh, Abraham had on that time. There are some obligations after uh, he um, did that, and um, uh, and then what we we see here is that there is a need for obedience. So if you want to follow me, I mean you have to uh, obey what I said. This is a covenant of grace. It was God's initiative, and He offers to do for us what we cannot. However, it's not a unilateral covenant. Some people think that okay. Um, God, I accept you, um, be uh, my God, and uh, I thank you for saving, but I will continue doing whatever I am. What do you mean? Well, I am kind, sometimes I need to, to cheat, sometimes I need to, when people are not around, I can steal a little bit, um, sometimes I need to... Um, you know, I am a business person. I need to kind of um, skip my my taxes and kind of overwrite them. And then sometimes, um, you know, um, I don't like these people. So um, some some of people I have to, to well, I don't treat them well. And uh, and then, but uh, Lord, I I am uh, your servant. Are you? That's the question of, are you really? So, the covenant with the Lord is not come, does not come with um, just God and no response from us. We need to have a response. Those who accept God's covenant have to do their part. The covenant is broken when he, we disobey God. And, and their part is simply, is simply, to follow, to follow, to, to dedicate to the Lord. I mean, we, as we feel that we are open to the Lord, okay, Lord, what is that you want me to do? And that's and that's the second part of the covenant. God does not save us because we obey Him, and so we should not go to the other extreme and say, okay, if I need to do something, I do that because I'm saved, because uh, I will be saved. In fact, our obedience to His law reflects our response of faith and love. 
So if we are um, working with the Lord, we automatically go in the direction with the Lord. So there are two types of religion here. That um, one is that um, I can do it. I do that by myself. And I will talk a little more about that. And the second is that I will do that because I'm safe, Lord. It's like a father and a child. Um, uh, if a child really wants to please their parents, I mean, if they really have love, they will obey. They will follow what they said. They are rebellious sometimes, but at the end they understand that uh, dad and mom, they know what is better for us and then and for, for the children. And then they will um, follow. There is a connection. There is a covenant between child and uh, and, and parents. And by the way, when there is no that connection, chaos will, will follow. When children are raised um, not obeying their parents, not having this uh, sense that um, uh, the parents are in charge sometimes, the parents know what is best, the parents guide us and, uh, and protect us and ask us to do this and not to do that, if they don't have this connection, they are lost for the world because they don't have uh, uh, boundaries, they don't have a sense of what is right and wrong, they will be criminals. Um, well, maybe not as exaggerated as that, but they have a potential to be people that will have trouble in the society because they didn't have this connection with a father and a mother and and someone in struggle, a respect for someone that is older, um, is in the Bible. Honor your father and your mother, because if you do so, you are going to live longer in the in, uh, on the earth. So uh, it's a commandment, by the way. So um, what I want to talk a little more is salvation by faith, and the secret. Uh, of salvation by faith that is exclusive for Christians. I, I'm sorry if you are from another religion. I'm sorry if you are, um, if, 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 if you, what you believe. Um, I remember I was talking to a friend and then I explained a little bit what is the salvation that comes from God. And he asked, well, um, is, isn't it enough to be good? Do you think the goodness is enough? Well, of course, if you are good, it's because God is acting in you. It's not because of you. But most of religions uh, are, are, are based on that you have to be good. You have to explore the goodness in you. Uh, and if you do good, you will be okay. And then people do offerings, donations, sacrifice, penitences, and, 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 and to, to be forgiven, to be to be purified, to reach God's uh, senses and, and mercy. And then because they do that, they think God will answer and there will be um, uh, a benefit for them. But it's not like that. Uh, in the past, I mean, um, I would not mention uh, the church, but uh, um, in some um, Christian, even Christian churches, uh, you could pay your way for salvation. They call indulgences. So you pay, if you pay for building a church, I mean, your sins were forgiven and you have a pass uh, to heaven. And this is not like that. I mean, we cannot pay for anything. We cannot pay for our salvation we cannot do anything to be saved. We do things because we are saved. And that's what we call salvation by faith. Jesus is the only one who can save. Our part is to accept him and walk with him. Then he, living in us, he will bring up the good things in our behavior. And that's the consequence. What we need, our role, is to stay with him, to walk with him, to not fall off 
of the um, um, wagon, as I would use this term. We need to stay close to Jesus. We need to stay with Him. And that's the secret um, for us. And that's why we need to pray, we need to read the Bible, we need to meditate, we need to, to go to church, we need to have uh, church f uh, friends, and, because we need to maintain this communication with the Lord. And that's the only thing that we have to do. We don't need to do any... And this is because we need, we need the Lord. So penitence like that, this is, um, well, I'm not going to mention where it is, and, but uh, people think that they can reach the Lord doing those sacrifices and climbing those stairs and doing some penitences and doing, and even the Christian church this happened, but uh, salvation is only by Jesus. What we do is a consequence of our faith in Jesus Christ. And then we have the history of uh, circumcision. And I will not stay much on that, but uh, Abraham was uh, asked to circumcise um, um, his male. Um, and this would be a sign of the covenant between him and uh, the Lord. And then what's the purpose of circumcision as a, as a sign of the covenant on that time? So, I would say to distinguish the seed of Abraham from the Gentiles. So, you are a special people and you do that uh, in order to be a distinction. To perpetuate the memory of the covenant. A sign of, the, of dedication to the Lord. Um, uh, uh, there is a, a, uh, in Deuteronomy uh, 10.16 that... Uh, our hearts should be, should be circumcised, so should be moral pure, uh, pureness that we should develop. To represent righteousness by faith, to symbolize circumcision of the heart, and to foreshadow the Christian rite of baptism. Um, why is circumcision not anymore a sign of the covenant? Well. This was somehow foreshadowing or foreseeing that one day um, we would not need to. This was from old times, and it looks like in the old times they have a little more ceremonies than that, that will foreshadow a, a, a new dedication to the Lord that was the baptism. After some time, uh, what happened is that um, they change around. A circumcision as um, an act of faith. Okay, Lord, I accept you and you ask me to be circumcised and circumcise my children. I'll do that because I'm, uh, I'm uh, your servant. Now they do the sacrifice as a rite of salvation. If I circumcise my kid, he is going to be saved because he is circumcised. The ones that are not are going to die. And that's the, the, the development that happened, that somehow messed up um, the meaning of circumcision. Circumcision was a sign, not an act of salvation on itself. Um, and then that's what happened today. Uh, I'm using this uh, example because I remember one time I was... Um, interviewing, when I was in medical school in Brazil, I was interviewing this uh, religious... Uh, so this person would uh, have in his religion this kind of uh, artifact that he used to punish himself. So let me show you. They, they used to have this um, a baston here with a rope and, um, and then at the end of the rope, it would be a ball full of spikes like this. And the person will um, hit in the back with this uh, uh, whip and then uh, will bleed, uh, um, will touch the skin and, and, and cause bleeding and very painful thing. And this, is, this was the way that they used to purify themselves, to overcome some, some stuff and to 
uh, be accepted by by the Lord. And in fact, we don't need to do that. Uh, circumcision was something from the back. We don't need that anymore. The only thing that the Christian church still um, advises is the baptism, and specifically the Baptist Church, and the Methodist Church, and the Seventh-day Adventist Church, we believe in the baptism by immersion. Um, that uh, it, it means it has a significant, um, uh, what a significance of, um, of uh, changing um, or a reborn. When, when you go under the water and you come back, you came back, you came back as a new person now um, following Jesus Christ uh, directly. When the principle of love is implanted in their heart, when man is renewed after the image of him that created him, the new covenant promise is fulfilled. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. Hebrews 10:16. Uh, and if the law is written in their heart, will it not shape the life? Obedience, the service and allegiance of love is the true sign of discipleship. So that's what we are trying to say uh, all the time here. First, we uh, receive. First, we receive. God's call. Then, with our minds, the frontal lobe, our brain, we accept that. And then we start living with God. Then, God give us His law and put His law in our heart. That is, again, heart is just a uh, representation. Is our frontal lobe again. And then, from that on, we will live a life of obedience following the commandments of the Lord, imitating Jesus Christ, being an ambassador for Jesus. And that's, and that's the way that we understand this part of, uh, of the covenant between you individually with the Lord, both of you in this covenant. And I will find, I will finish this with a story that I found, uh, I heard that when I was a child, and uh, it will always stay with me. This is the contemplation story. And this was uh, about a girl that was a poor girl. Sorry if, if you have heard that story before. But um, it was a poor girl that went to the um, areas, uh, the dumping side of the city, and then she found this statue of a very eminent uh, uh, woman in the society that was there in the corner. And then each day that she would go to that dumping site, she would find that statue. And then she started observing and contemplating that the lady has the hair in a, such a style. And then she tried to change her hair like the, like the statue. And then she found that uh, the lady was with a very good posture. And then she started developing that posture. And then tried to find some clothes that are similar to that lady and the shoes that are similar to the. And then with the time that she uh, was contemplating that statue, the girl changed her appearance uh, with the things that she was able to do in the, um, on their reach. She was able to, to change her own uh, appearance based on what she was contemplating. And this is exactly what happened with us in our covenant with the Lord. We start observing, we start knowing more about the Lord. We, we start knowing more about His plan for us. And, and we are transformed by that. So... Just because we follow um, what the Lord says, just, was, just because we put our lives in His hands and He is in command, we start changing. We start doing different things. We start going to different places. We start having our lives modeled on the life of Jesus Christ. And this is the covenant that God wants to do um, with us, that we ended up being 
his representatives in the world, uh, or in Christian terms, his missionaries to the people that need salvation. And salvation is open to everyone. Let's finish this with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for this study. Uh, be with us that we can grow with you, that we can contemplate you over and over, and that we can learn more about you and be your representatives to the world. Open up, inspire us, give us your Holy Spirit for us to follow you, to stay closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys. I'll see you next time.